David French, welcome back to the Holy Post. Thanks for having me. I okay. We have a another dilemma this month, as I seem to have every month with you. Is there's so much happening, and you've oh, written gosh. so many thoughtful pieces about what's happening that we can't possibly cover it all, and I don't know what to do about that. Well, I mean, you know, and especially since just yesterday, yesterday from when we record this, there was this huge Vanity Fair profile of Jerry Falwell Jr. and that thing is like peeling an onion. I mean, just that one piece, it's unbelievable. Well, that's what we're going to do. I mean, we may touch <laughs> some other things, <laughs> but we're going to go after that <laughs> onion. I read it yesterday and started tweeting about it. You read it yesterday or today and had a whole Twitter thread about it. And everyone's talking mm-hmm. about this piece. So let's do that. Guess what day it is? Oh, it's French Friday. It's French Friday. So grab your fries and say hooray. David French is here to play on French Friday. It's French Friday. Okay, Jerry Falwell Jr. Um, I'm not sure most of our audience needs to be brought completely up to date on this character mm-hmm. because he's been so prominent over the last couple of years, especially in his key role in introducing uh, some credibility to the Trump campaign back in 2015, 2016. Um, give us a brief overview of where he is right now, based on your understanding of his time at Liberty University and what led to his resignation there. Yeah, I think a good way of describing it would be he's in a kind of an exile <laughs> at the moment, if if that makes some sense. I mean, he, you know, he rose to prominence at Liberty in part because um, he played a big role in rescuing Liberty from real financial difficulties. Um, and under his presidency, as you know, as is the case with a lot of people who've crashed and burned, where we've seen them preside over incredible growth and prosperity, you know, we just... Uh, I think half of evangelicalism listened to the rise and fall of Mars Hill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're very familiar with the story um, that he helped rescue Liberty from uh, financial difficulty. He was the first of sort of the big time evangelical figures to endorse Donald Trump, was all in on Donald Trump. Um, then when Trump won, occupied this really pretty unique place for a college professor, which is lots of access to the president of the United States and to the Oval Office. Um, But as he was really sort of ascending to the highest of heights, there was a lot of increasing amount of rather obvious evidence that things were not okay um, with him, with his family. And we don't need to go into all of the scandals. We can go into some of them. But, you know, the Liberty Board eventually lets him go, which then triggers him filing a lawsuit against the Liberty Board. The Liberty Board files a lawsuit against him. And where we are now is um, it appears that one of the individuals who was sort of indispensable to uh, Falwell's fall was this pool boy who apparently had an affair with his wife. That's what his wife and and Jerry Falwell have admitted. The pool boy claims it was more of a uh, (laughs) – thruple relationship, if that's the right word, where Falwell, this was all taking place with Falwell's knowledge and enthusiastic acquiescence and uh, observation. And apparently this guy's about to come out with his own story. And so vanity, the Vanity Fair piece to me felt like opening yourself up to a reporter to sort of get your side out yeah, first. to get ahead of it. And so nobody's denying that there was an extramarital affair. Right. The difference is the Falwells are saying this is this is an issue of of sinfulness, whereas the pool boy is saying, no, this is a scandal because it, it, it wasn't – there's a lot more layers to it than just a run-of-the-mill marital affair, extramarital affair. Okay, to take a step back though – um, for some of our younger listeners, perhaps who don't quite remember the history or didn't live the history, <laughs> right. you got to put Jerry Falwell Jr. in some context. Obviously, he was the president of Liberty University, which is, I believe, the largest evangelical college in the world, at least in the country. Certainly in America. Yeah. I would, unless there's a unless there's a school I don't know about, it's. I think it's the largest in the world. If it if it's not the largest in the world, it's certainly right up there. Right. And unlike many Christian and name only 
universities. Mm-hmm. Liberty takes its Christian identity very, very seriously. Their mission statement is something about uh, f- you know, forming men and women in the image of Christ or you know, very evangelical language. They have very um, well-known and strict moral policies for their students, for their faculty. The Liberty Way. The Liberty mm-hmm. Way, right. So they, they definitely wear their faith on their sleeve. Yes. Liberty was founded by Jerry Falwell Jr.'s father, Jerry Mm -hmm. Falwell Sr., who was also the founder of the Moral Majority, one of the key pillars of the rise of the religious right in the 1970s and 80s. So the marriage between conservative politics, Republican politics, white conservative Christianity, all of that happened when Jerry Jerry Falwell Jr. was young and spearheaded by his father. So he is kind of the heir of this whole movement and some of the most influential institutions of that movement. Yes. Yes. Like I, I would put it this like this. He is, uh, uh, imagine him as the heir of one of the Lords of Westeros. <laughs> 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 he, he You're is showing a, your geekdom a little bit. Oh, well, I, you know, we've only barely begun to do that, but <laughs> the, he, he is, um, he, you know, he has a lineage and it's not just any lineage, but it's, it is one of the foremost, he's the son of, of one of the fathers of the modern evangelical conservative movement. I mean, one of the top three or four figures in the entire history of forming sort of modern political evangelicalism. Sure. And so by now, many of us are familiar, or at least maybe we're getting a little desensitized to significant evangelical leaders having moral failures or some kind of impropriety that brings them down. And so, you know, that's not really the news here for me. Right. Or the the headline in this article. Um, One of the things that did grab me, and it's a call out very early on in the piece, is a quote from Falwell Jr. where he says, because of my last name, people think I'm a religious person, but I'm not. Yeah. And I, I tweeted this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, because of your last name, but also because you're the president of the largest evangelical university in the world. Yeah. It's not an unrealistic expectation to think that maybe you take <laughs> faith seriously. Right. And you weren't conscripted to be the president of the university either. I mean, right. you, you know, you're making at one point he was what making 800,000 or so dollars a year doing this. He was being, you know, he's spending a time with one of the most powerful, the most powerful man in the world. Um, it would be one thing if he was a real estate developer, or say he worked for, you know, Microsoft and he carried that last name and people were imposing expectations on him that he didn't want to live up to. But he took this mantle. I mean, this, yeah, the whole thing struck me as an exercise in trying to say, wait a minute, I'm not really one of those Christians. You know, it, at one point, he even takes on organized religion. Right. Which I literally, when I read that, I laughed out loud because if, if Liberty University is an organized religion, I don't know what is organized religion. So the, the the one of the core questions I came away with from this article is is Jerry Falwell Jr. a tragic figure or is is he a villain? I mean they're not mutually exclusive. Perhaps, yeah. But part of me felt like oh this guy was raised with these expectations. He kind of got sucked into the family business accidentally. It wasn't his intent to follow in his father's footsteps, but he found himself in that situation. Fast forward a few decades and he's like I don't really take Christian faith all that seriously. I didn't want to be head of this giant institution. I like to drink alcohol. The sexual morality of myself and my wife are certainly questionable on multiple levels. Yeah. Um, and now we're we're facing the music for living a double life, but I didn't choose this life in the first place. So, And that paints it as sort of a tragic story. But like you said, no one conscripted him into this. He could have gotten out at any time. He 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 used his position as the president of the largest Christian university to prop up a future president of the United States. He used his evangelical identity when it benefited him at length. So wh- if you had to pick, is he the villain or is he the victim here? <laughs> I mean, I overwhelmingly predominantly the villain because there's a lot here that's not even talked about. So this this is very much of a personal look at Jerry Falwell Jr. often in mainly Jerry Falwell Jr.'s sort of words, you know, um, yeah. the author of the piece uh really basically comes in and he says, 
here's this, what I'm sharing with you is how they at least say they see themselves. How, this is how Jerry and Becky Falwell say they see themselves. And, and so that's why in a lot of ways you feel like he just sort of let Falwell, you know, he just let Falwell run with it. Um, but when you pull back and you look at the larger context and, and you look at a larger context that includes things, uh, as I've written before about just the really terrible ways in which, um, Liberty and, and the women who've come forward to allege really terrible ways that Liberty failed in its responsibilities to enforce, um, its, you know, prohibition prohibitions and, uh, against sexual assault or to protect people from sexual, sexual assault or impose proper procedures, the ways in which the quote unquote Liberty way were used in, in ways that truly harmed people that excesses in the Liberty way at the same time that the president is explicitly disclaiming it and saying, you know, these rules are for thee and not for me. Um, right. You know, and they talk about how they liked, you know, going down to Miami where they felt like they were free of a lot of the restraints of being in Lynchburg and they would drink more openly and they would do all of these things that would get a student thrown out of school. And and in that circumstance, I just I have a hard time putting myself in their shoes and saying, man, you're 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 sort of a tragic figure here. Um, it seemed like he was taking all that he could from his name and taking all that he could from his affiliation with Liberty while taking as little as he could from the op in the form of obligations or right. assuming as little as he could in the form of obligation. And that's a very unsustainable lifestyle. And that brings you to the tragic part of this, which is that is a life that is set for a collapse. That is a life that is sort of on its way. And this is just a lesson, I think, you know, for all of us on the, that sort of road or that path of temptation. It's, you know, like when the prodigal son set off, set off his ambition wasn't to end, end up with the pigs. Right. Um, and there so he is that, right there. Yeah, there he is right there. <laughs> there he is. Me. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, the article gets into great detail about the nature of the relationship between Becky Falwell, Jerry Falwell's mm -hmm. wife, and the pool boy, Gian Giancarlo Granda, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into the details of the relationship. People can read yeah. that if they want to read it. And there's, he said, she said all over the place on this stuff. Um, but the relationship is relevant in that it clearly shows a long pattern of being comfortable with uh, living a double life. Yeah. Because even by their own admission, Jerry Falwell Jr. knew about this affair and kept it hidden, you know, didn't expose it for whatever reasons. The hypocrisy that existed with them is one thing we could spend all kinds of time diagnosing and looking at what are the spiritual implications of that and parallels to the prodigal son, whatever. I want to take a step back though and look at the broader implications institutionally for what does this say about the way evangelicalism is functioning right now in this country. And on that front, where is Liberty's board in all of this? Because here's a guy who by his own admission, says, I'm not religious. I am not eager to follow these guidelines, but yet was kept in place at the top of this university by a board that I have to believe was aware of something that wasn't right. You know, that that is exactly the kind of thing that independent investigations are for, <laughs> um, and independent accountability, because I would bet you money that you could bring in a board member in here and they could put their hand in the air and they could say, Sky, I didn't know. I promise. I didn't know. I was presented one face. Um, I didn't even know to inquire beyond what I was presented with. There was a lot of good things. There were a lot of good things going on at Liberty. My obligations as a board member, I'm only meeting every now and then. You know, it's not like I'm there on campus. It's not like I'm watching him every day. So that that's the defense you might hear is I, I didn't know in my capacity. I didn't have the information flow. But then on the other hand, you know, I'm living in Franklin, Tennessee, hundreds of miles from Lynchburg. And the deficiencies and defects in, in Falwell's character were obvious four years 
from a distance. Yeah, okay. we talked about it regularly on the Holy Post. Just from what was being reported in the media, Falwell's own statements to his university, things he said on the campaign trail with Trump, pictures he posted he on tweeted? his own Twitter account. Yeah. Right. And so from that standpoint, you say, no. So you respond to that person who says, with their hand in the air, I didn't know. And the answer is, you should. <laughs> yeah. You should. You know, you're if you're a member of a board, you're not a passive participant. You're an active participant. And so that means actively following what your subordinate is up to, the president of the university, actively following and holding him accountable. But Sky, I think you and I both know from really grim experience that Christian institutions are more forgiving of more discretion, the more prosperous the leader makes the institution um, or the more popular the leader makes the institution. So, right. you know, they will fire a janitor instantaneously if, say, they find out a janitor is sexting a, um, a woman they met. Um, if it's a one of the world's most famous Christian apologists, they won't even ask for his demand. They'll ask, but they won't demand his personal technology to see if he's engaged in misconduct. So the the level here of, and I was referring to the Ravi Zacharias situation, the level here, and there seems to be almost like a mathematical equation, is the more popular and or prosperous that you can make a ministry so that you can say, look at all the lives that are changed, the greater degree of leeway that is given to the leader of that ministry. Which is ironic because what we're instructed in the New Testament is precisely the opposite. <laughs> right. That those who have more responsibility and authority will be held to a higher standard. Right. And especially teachers will be judged more strictly, as Paul says. So, oh, okay. Um <laughs> <laughs> Beyond Falwell Jr., though, the, the article, again, it's from his point of view, so we got to consider that. He talks a lot about his family of origin, his parents, uh, his very famous mm -hmm. father, and he talks about some of the hypocrisies he saw in his father's own faith, and he was a, a very prominent religious leader. At one point, the article says that his father's contradictions would mold Jerry's entire life, and then... Um, Jerry grew up to learn that he too could have a private life that didn't align with his public persona. And he's he's saying that I learned that from my father. It reminds me of the old the old drug commercial. I learned it from watching you, right? When he the dad confronts the kid about smoking weed. Um, yeah. which brings into into question the is the entire moral majority Christian right evangelical enterprise is it all just a house of cards built on a terrible foundation is the whole thing just theater you know boy so let me say this it is so obvious to me in reading that profile that jerry falwell jr is trying to paint himself as a tragic figure right it, it is so obvious to me that that's what's going on he throws his brother under the bus he throws his father under the bus he he throws his mother under the bus i mean in this telling nobody you know even jonathan falwell who you know a lot of people i know have a lot of respect for jonathan falwell everybody is painted in a in a dark manner here and frankly, when I read it, I don't know what to believe, to be honest. I don't have any real um, sense that Jerry Falwell is a person whose account I should credit. And so, you know, so when I'm, I, I'm very reluctant to dive into, does this, does this, th does this account tell us anything meaningful about his family? Because I don't want to play the game he's pretty obviously playing. Yeah, here. at least not played on his terms not play it on his terms. I do think that we do need, as, as you and I have done in some of our conversations, as you, as you and Phil have been doing quite a bit, we do need to reevaluate the last 40 years of history here and, and ask what kind of movement was being built and what has it become and were the seeds of what we have seen in the last five to six years planted from the very beginning. And 
that's where, you know, for example, uh, the, the Jesus and John Wayne book, which I think is look, you know, there are parts of it. I think it might go a little too far here or this person. I might disagree with the characterization there, but the directional impulse of it, I think is very right to be honest that you can go back and you can see the seeds of where we are having been planted third, 30, 40 years ago. And yeah. I, and I, without even having to get into Jerry Falwell seniors family, which I feel like after reading that, uh, account, I really don't want to credit anything Falwell jr says. Cause I feel like it's narrative service here sure without even getting into Falwell senior's family i think it is very fair to say that from the beginning there were problems there that in full transparency were not apparent to me <laughs> until i got a lot older yeah i mean to that point um i think the the conversation a lot of us have been having for many years now is as these stories emerge of scandal and mismanagement and there's you know, they're, they're legion at this point. We've been asking the question, is this a bug within American evangelicalism or is it a feature? And the more of these stories that emerge, the more, you know, the evidence for it's a feature. It's something that was embedded. There's something rotten at the, in the DNA of this thing that needs to be looked at. It's not, I remember, um, just before the pandemic, I was at a mega church in many, uh, where was I? Milwaukee. Right. Um, for a, a conference that I was speaking at and a bunch of the speakers were in lunch together in the green room. I was the only non mega church pastor kind of on the docket, at least in the, right. in the lunch. And we were all talking about the scandals, the different stories mm -hmm. that were rummaging about at that time. And many of these pastors had are from churches that had their own leadership scandals, yeah. including the church that was hosting the conference. And so I ended up asking these other pastors, you know, do you, do you think, these stories are the result of just bad character on the mm -hmm. individuals who were at the center of these scandals. Or at some point, do you wonder, is there something systemic going on here? And I like, you know, these are my peers. Many of them are, are friends, but every one of them said the same thing. That, no, 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 no. This is not systemic. There's nothing wrong with the way we're structuring our churches or doing ministry. This is just weak character of individuals who, who fell. And I was kind of like, are you kidding me? Like after all these stories, you're still, you still don't think they're, and I get it. Part of it's they're benefiting from that system now themselves. And maybe it's difficult to call into question, but I think that's the real struggle I have with this article. It's not just the scandalous nature of Jerry Falwell Jr. It's, is this yet another glimpse at the failure of American evangelicalism to produce what it's claiming it produces? I, I think it's, you know, at this point, the evidence, let, let me, let me just put it this way. Let's sort of flip it around. Okay. There is not a universe that I can imagine where if you flip around the scandals and you put them all in left-wing institutions, <laughs> where the American evangelicalism would not be looking at that and saying, look at the systemic rot in the system. Right. I mean, I mean that's repetitive. <laughs> look at the systemic <laughs> rot. Um, so, for example, uh, largest university in evangelicalism has, and, and Falwell Jr. is the tip of a, uh, an iceberg there. Most um, powerful apologist in in uh, American evangelicalism, the largest and one of the more influential institute, one of the largest Christian summer camps in America, which is, which to people who are not part of evangelicalism, especially evangelicalism in the Midwest and South, Canuck don't realize the magnitude of that institution and the extent of its incredible, gross negligence in incredibly aggressive, punitive um, posture that it took towards victims of a super predator and its gross negligence and permitting a super predator to operate on, on in the camp. And you can just go down the line again and again and again. And, and if, oh, well, and disproportionate numbers of people saying the vaccine is, you shouldn't take the vaccine spreading misinformation that's killing people, that is killing people. And then you have hundreds of praying Christians storming the U.S. Capitol. And if you flip that around and it was all secular folks, it was all, you know, in the same way that people rightfully went after Hollywood 
when the Me Too movement was exposing Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and others, right? Or you know, rightfully questioning what's going on in the Muslim world when jihadists were on the ascendancy. You know, imagine if January sixth, instead of American flags and Christian prayers, those were jihadist flags and Muslim prayers. There wouldn't be a evangelical leader in America saying, "Oh, that's overblown. We we need to move on. We need to move on." So. When you flip it around, it can be very clarifying as to whether or not there's something systemic. And and I had this, I had a two, two, just two little vignettes that I think are quite telling. I was talking to somebody, very, very smart observer of American evangelicalism. And he said something just that really kind of hit me. And it was this. He said, you often see leaders who view the fruit of the spirit as weakness. That, that the fruit of the Spirit is an impediment to their advance. It's an, it's an impediment to their advance. So that, that's one thing that um, you know, just sort of really hit me between the eyes about this moment. And, you know, and the other one is just related to, to what I just said is we have become incredibly adept at using individual instances of misconduct to call out systematic injustice in those who are outside the church and while at the same time taking extremely prominent moments of of scandal in the church and calling that isolated and saying that's isolated so sure. what whatever happens out there is evidence of a systemic problem Whatever happens in here is evidence of an individual problem. Yeah, we we magnify the scope of the error outside our tribe and minimize the scope of the problem within our tribe, and that's a human instinct. We, oh gosh, it's, it's everywhere. It's just sad that it's no less common among yes. evangelicals in America. Um, that comment of the observer you mentioned, who who said that we we can what, how do you put it minimize or see the fruit of the spirit as a as an impediment. To the, the fruit of the spirit is a uh, that ev- the fruit of the spirit is evidence of weakness. Yeah. Um, what comes to my mind? I know this isn't exactly what he was trying to say, but people get hung up on that moment in the Gospels where Jesus talks about all all sins will be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and people, go, oh right. my gosh, is that, what does that mean? And have I done that? And everything. One way of understanding that is when you attribute to the enemy the things of God. You are so far gone, you are so far lost without the ability to recognize anymore what is truly of God and what isn't that you're, you know, forget it, you're, you're toast. Um, I wonder if that's partly where we are, where we call what is good, evil and evil good, as Isaiah said would happen. And when, when you look at the fruit of the spirit and go, oh, well, that that's weakness, that's not the kingdom of God, that's not what Christ affirms. And then you look at belligerence and anger aggression, greed, um, malice, all those things and go, oh, that's good. That's the kingdom of God. I mean, that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is kind of terrifying. Well, you know, we think of it, you know, think of situations like this. Um, so for example, there was this JD Vance, um, profile in the American conservative somewhere, uh, uh, sometime recently. And he said, I think our people hate the right people. Yeah. You know, so you're talking about and others sort of saying just scorning the very idea of decency, right? Scorning the very idea of civility. Um, and when you begin to get because and and some of these folks are some of the biggest proponents of quote unquote, in, uh, they're the biggest proponents of inerrancy and sound doctrine. Um, and yet aren't the fruits of the spirit part of sound doctrine, right? Isn't isn't someone who's dedicated to inerrancy capable of reading words like kindness, <laughs> patience, peace, joy, you know? So these, these, when you begin to see this kind of conduct and, and, and this really brings up something I think that's big sky. And and the big thing that it brings up is we have a lot of ideological slash theological arguments that go something like this. And that is, Okay, I'm not saying that if you disagree with me on, say, complementarianism or whatever, I'm not saying that that separates you. It means you're unsaved. But what I am saying is that you're on a road that if you're 
if you're the slippery you're slope, dis- you're on that slippery slope. You're sliding yeah. down that slide. And so I'm not saying that your disagreement with me on inerrancy is, or I mean on on um, complementarianism means that uh, you're going to hell or you're not a Christian, but you're on a road that I that I've noticed has, you know, a lot of people who disagree with me end up la- leaving the faith kind of thing. OK, but I, a lot of that, what I'm seeing is something entirely different. Uh, what I'm seeing is wait a minute, an awful lot of people are looking at sort of the arc, the the prime voices for true doctrine, the prime voices for inerrancy, the prime voices voices for a really, um, you know, uh, a highly particularized version of complementarianism, and they're not seeing the fruit of the spirit. They are seeing a lot of cruelty, right? They are seeing a lot of, of deception. They are seeing a lot of, uh, of plainly, you know, the, the scripture says, be angry, but do not sin, but a plainly unmerited fury that is leading to sin. And yet, and so they're saying that, that we're the guardians of doctrine but they're sitting there flat out defying doctrine. I mean, not even anything that's controversial between complementarians and egalitarians. I mean, the, the two sides don't disagree about what the fruits of the spirit are, right? They don't. And yet they're just completely chucking that out the window and then advertising themselves as the guardians of true Christianity. And, you know, my wife, so I, I've, I've shared this a little bit before. I grew up in a, a very, very conservative, they don't even like to call themselves denomination, but called the Church of Christ, truly sectarian. And the classic Church of Christ was we are the Christians and nobody, right. nobody else. So my wife, and this is, again, not telling any stories out of school because she wrote about it in the Washington Post, was abused. Uh, and when she was 12, sexually abused by a preacher in the Church of Christ. And, and the Church of Christ was saying, this is Christianity. This is Christianity. And here she is abused. Nobody protected her. Nobody stood up for her. And if this is Christianity, she didn't want any part of that. You know? Yeah. And I think this is what some of these guys need to reckon with. They're not talking to a community that is living a theological mind, world. They're talking to a community that is experiencing the way in which they are being treated. And it completely defies Christian doctrine. And that is so much more harmful than whether, you know, how, how much time can a woman spend (laughs) or can a woman spend any time on the stage or whatever at the pulpit on Sunday? Yeah. uh, Amen. A bunch of things come to mind. One is, Jonathan Haidt often uses the metaphor of a rider and an elephant. Yes. Amen. You're familiar yeah. with that? So oh, the, yeah. <laughs> the rider representing your rational self, the elephant representing your emotional, more intuitive self. And there are folks out there who think, they think they're the rider on the elephant. If we just have the right doctrine, if we just teach yeah. the right truths, that's all that matters. And the rest of the world, the rest of the church is being driven by the elephant going, yeah, but you're a jerk. You're abusive. Yeah. You're belligerent. You're angry. You're vindictive. You're prideful, all those things, and they don't want to follow you. And guess what? The elephant's going to have its way. It's not going to be your rational theological arguments that win the day. But beyond that, I'm I'm 40, I'm almost 46 years old. And so I'm so young. So, I'm so young. young. Yeah. <laughs> Fresh trick here. Um I'm about the perfect age for the the group of men who became very enamored with Mark Driscoll when he mm. was on his ascent at Mars Hill, which mm-hmm as you said, like half of evangelicalism has listened to that podcast. And I remember when I was a seminary student in the late 90s and a young pastor in the early 2000s, and I had many peers who were very enamored with Driscoll and Mars Hill and everything that was going on there. And when I w- whenever I talked to people about that, and then I started working at Christianity Today and got to know some of the people who worked with Driscoll and kind of saw behind the curtain a little bit and was not impressed. And so when I talked to my friends about why are you so committed to Mark Driscoll, what I heard over and over and over again was, well, he's saying the truth. He's preaching mm. the truth. Mm-hmm. And I would ask them, yeah, okay, arguably, if you are into that theology, then he's saying the truth. But what about his character? 
And mm-hmm. what's clearly depicted in his preaching and in his rhetoric and in his engagement with people aren't, isn't that troubling at all? And they're like, no, because it's the truth. And one thing that struck me, I forgot who told me this, but it brought to my attention, it's pretty striking that Paul does not list truth among the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. It's, and there's a reason. Because doctrinal truth, as James would say in his epistle, even the demons believe there's one God and they shudder, right? Yeah. Knowledge of yeah. the truth is not what sets a Christian apart from a non-believer. Right. It is, it is abiding in that truth, who's the person of Christ, and through your abiding in him, the fruit of his character comes out in your character. You will know them by their fruit, Jesus says. And the fruit in the context of the Sermon on the Mount are things like patience and kindness and loving your enemy and speaking honestly and being meek and humble. And and when you don't see any of that in a Christian leader, but they're saying the truth, well, congratulations, they have the same qualifications as a demon at that point. But why you well, hit your wagon to them and follow them is beyond me. Uh, well, it's, it's, you know, it's not just speaking the truth. It's an, and he was reaching people, you know, and he was right. growing and he was, so that, so you know, there's sort of this narrative we have that of the modern evangelical church that goes like this. And we've talked about this before in that in the 50s and 60s, sort of American Christianity had this big split. So the main line departs from Christian orthodoxy and withers. And the evangelical world adheres to orthodoxy and thrives. Okay. And so what that began to do is sort of create a narrative that says, if you're adhering to orthodoxy, you thrive. And in, you know, in fact, some of what was going on was you're not just thriving because you're adhering to orthodoxy. It's not, in fact, uh, there's often a lot of biblical precedent that if you're speaking the truth, even in love, that you're going to be, oh, I don't know, crucified, perhaps. <laughs> right. So, so the fact of the matter is there isn't necessarily a giant biblical precedent for this idea that says as long as you're speaking the truth, you're going to grow and you're going to grow and you're going to grow and the liars are going to shrink and they're going to shrink and they're going to shrink. Maybe something else was going on mm-hmm. there that sociologically, historically, that led to some of this growth. But again, Sky, we keep going back to this really sort of selective doctrinal zeal. Um, so, you know, first Corinthians 13, one, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging, clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So again, you get back to this sort of similar theme that says that, wait a minute, You know, there are a series of character qualities and virtues that are marks, that are signs, that are fruits of God's presence in his inworking and the Holy Spirit's inworking, sanctifying presence in your life. And when those are seen as optional, but other metrics like church growth, um, YouTube views, Twitter reach, Oval Office access are seen as um, imperative or more important or, uh, or the greater of one, the less you have to have of the other, <laughs> Yeah, then, then you're in real trouble. Which explains a lot of, um, a popular evangelical support for Donald Trump, because they're not looking at character fruit. They're looking at what they view as effectiveness, power, domination right. over others. There was, um, when I was a seminary student, there was a story from the Old Testament that I don't think I had really read prior to seminary. That's the nice thing about going to seminary is you're forced to read things <laughs> even in the yeah. Bible that you don't take seriously earlier. And for me, it was a pivotal um, moment in my formation as a pastor that changed my perspective. And you're probably familiar with the story, but it's in Numbers chapter 20, and it's the failure of Moses at Meribah. So the, the backstory is the people, as often happened in, in the wilderness, they started complaining. They didn't have any water. They didn't have any food. Why did you bring us out here so that we die? We should have stayed in Egypt, all that. Moses and Aaron go to the tent of meeting, to the tabernacle. They prostrate themselves before the presence of God very humbly and seek a solution to this. And God gives them the solution. He says, go out to the people, speak to the rock, and it will pour forth water for the people and the, and the cattle and everything else. Moses leaves the tabernacle, gathers with the community, and there's some debate about exactly what happens here, an interpretive 
framing of the story, but Moses rebukes the people. He calls them rebels. Mm -hmm. And then he disobeys God. And instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock with his shepherd's staff twice. And at that point, you go, okay, Moses disobeys. And if you read further, this is the sin that prevents him from entering the promised land. And the Lord says, you didn't obey me. You're not going to enter the promised land. You're going to die within sight of it. It's a terrible judgment upon Moses for his disobedience. But the crazy, one other thing, like, why did he strike it with his staff? When you know the history of the staff, almost every miracle that God had ever performed through Moses had been with his shepherd's staff, right? Mm, It became mm -hmm. a snake before the Egyptian magicians, the parting of the sea, the turning the Nile and the blood, all these things were done with the staff. And on a previous account, Moses was told by God to strike a rock with his staff and it would bring forth fresh water. And it did. So every other time it had been the staff. In this case, it seemed like Moses was under an enormous amount of pressure. He's worried about what's going to happen if they don't perform a miracle. So he relies on what's always worked in the past, which was mm-hmm. the staff. So it's a it's a case of trusting in a, in a tool that God had given him rather than the Lord itself. himself. The crazy part of the story is despite his disobedience, a miracle still occurs. And fresh water comes out and the people are overjoyed and they celebrate. And so if you were to look at that ministry from just a human point of view, you would say Moses was, it was successful, right? It was effective. It was relevant. And it's hard to be more relevant than giving water to people in a desert. Everyone was thrilled. It was pragmatic. It was fantastic. I mean, he'd be writing books, how to draw water from rocks in three steps and speaking at ministry conferences and everything else. But from God's perspective, he was a failure. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's a lot of what ends up happening in our ministries is we look at the wrong fruit. We look at the wrong metrics and we say, look at all the people who are coming. Look at all the impact that's occurring. Look at all the world change that's going on. And those things may genuinely be from God, but they might be happening in spite of the leader, not because of them. That's such a great point. I look at it as the difference between God's mercy and God's favor. So God in his infinite mercy provided water to the Israelites, right. these Israelites, the people he loves. Right. God in his infinite mercy, if I'm in Mark Driscoll's church or I'm sitting in uh, a camp like Kanakuk and I give my life to Jesus in that moment, God's mercy and love for me is being made evident in that moment. But then what happens is the leaders who are there when God's mercy is being made evident for people that who God loves then often view that as evidence of divine favor right. and divine sanction for their methods, for the state of their heart, for just who they are. And, and that's not necessarily the case at all. And, and so we're constantly looking at, because you know we know, we know what the fruits are. We, it's right there. It's just right there in black and white. It's one of the least ambiguous parts of the Bible as to what the fruits of the Spirit are. And again and again, we say of powerful people, no, 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 no. Don't look at that. Don't look at that. Look at this other thing. Look at this other thing. Look at this other thing. And time and again, in Scripture, in Scripture is saying, no, don't look at the other thing. Don't look at speaking in the you know tongues of men and angels. Don't look at you know, he, you know. Don't look at this evidence. This this mighty worker. This mighty worker. This mighty work. It's do you know me? Do you have love? And and yet we contradict contradict that again and again. Yeah. Did I not cast out demons in your name? Exactly. Matthew seven. I was just going to mention that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the day of judgment, and he says, "Many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name?" cast out demons and do mighty works. And you know, in the context, he's speaking to a Jewish audience. It's the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about the day of judgment and he's talking about people coming to him and saying, Lord, Lord. And they're declaring Jesus is the rightful judge right. on the day of judgment, which in a Jewish context means they're declaring Jesus as equal with God. So they have good theology. They believe in the divinity of Jesus. They say they're prophesying in his name. They're preaching in the name of Jesus. Casting out demons, take it literally, take it figuratively. We could say that these are people who worked against evil in the world. They were Mm -hmm. activists. Right. And they performed miracles, mighty works. They spent their whole life apparently serving Jesus and genuinely going to eternity, convinced they belong to him. And he says, I never knew you away from me. 
So how do you make sense of that? Well, it also comes right on the heels of when he said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Good tree bears good fruit, bad tree, bad fruit. It's Mm -hmm. what we've been talking about this whole time. We seem in, in large segments of American evangelicalism to be deceived and addicted to measuring the wrong fruit. Yeah. And I'll tell you what scares me the most about that story is Jesus says many. Mm -hmm. Many will come to me on the day of judgment and say these things. Many will believe they belong to me because of their effectiveness. And they're going to be in for a surprise. And that's my greatest concern is so much of American evangelicalism may be leading people astray with the illusion that they belong to Jesus just because they spend their life serving him. And that's well, and Sky, not the same thing. Yeah. And Sky, you know, I think about this all the time in my own work. You know, I'm a writer. I podcast. I want to reach people. You know, I and I I get gratified when I see that something that I've written that an awful lot of people have read. And I have to really, you know, and prayerfully just go to God on this and say, God, please protect me from idolization of metrics. <laughs> Please protect me from, you know, that this same thing. Cause it's so easy to sort of say, you know, look at all those people who fell for the big crowd. Look at all those people who fell for, um, you know, the huge, the, the stream of donations or the big viewerships or the million right. person YouTube, look at those guys. And then, you know, the same temptations play on me. I want people to read. I want people to hear and what I, what I write. And so I think it's something that all of us who are in this world where there's a a drive to reach out, to reach out, to reach out, we need to constantly be checking ourselves against the fruits of the spirit and checking ourselves, um, in, in that we don't end up becoming and and I'm I'm not talking about you, Sky. I'm telling on. I'm talking about me here. <laughs> well, I don't want to become. I don't want to become in decrying the very thing that I think is is really troublesome to the church. I don't want to become the thing that's troublesome to the church. And um and I and and, and I think that recognition of our own uh, frailty is is got to be step one in approaching the public square. To, to bring it back to the Falwell story a little bit and, and connecting to what you just said, one of the themes that stood out to me was the degree to which he and his wife tried to escape the bubble mm. of Lynchburg. And you mentioned them mm-hmm. going to Miami and feeling like they could be themselves there and be outside of the, the fishbowl of being looked at and stuff. I wonder if part of the, the antidote to falling into the trap that you mentioned is we just need to be known. Yeah. And known well, not not by a broad public, but I know for me, the check on my life is what does my wife think about me yeah. right now? What do my kids yeah. think about me? <laughs> what do my close friends think about me? What yeah. do the people who know me have known me for 20 years in my small group or my church, which we're going out to dinner in a little bit? Like, how do what are they seeing in me? Mm-hmm. And if those relationships are unhealthy, full of strife, anger, resentment, uh, you know, go on down the list of terrible things, then it's a pretty good sign that I'm bearing some rotten fruit. Yeah. But that that's without that a... barometer, we can be so yeah. self-deceived because we just get an email from someone who's a fan and we're like, oh, see, there's, there's great fruit because I, I wrote yeah. or said something great. And that's completely not reality. I mean, I think it's so important for anybody, even if you're listening to this and you're just starting a ministry and you've got like nine people at church, <laughs> you know, you're, you're just starting. It is so important to, sur- to have people in your life who have freedom to speak truth to you who are not on your payroll <laughs> 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 or don't, or don't derive some sort of glow from your, whatever power or prominence you have. I right. mean, you see this again and again with these powerful people who fall. It it turns out that sometimes their board members aren't really board members. Uh, they get more prestige from being on the board yeah. than they give accountability to the president or the founder of the ministry. And it's so important. I have a group of friends that I've had since my f- first day of my freshman year of college. 
And if you want to talk about people who have total, not just don't, don't just feel the freedom, but exercise the freedom to the fullest <laughs> to tell me when I'm off base, that's, that's those friends. And, and I wouldn't have it any other way. It is. And, and my wife, the same relationship. And, you know, as my kids are getting older, the same relationship with my kids mm -hmm. is just that you have total freedom to say, and without it being a, costing us our relationship to, to say, David, you're, you're off base. You're just off base. And I'll give you a super fast story along these lines. Um, you know, as you know, and you and I both have the same similar reality that occurs online is we just get attacked a lot. And, yeah, and you get it more than I do, but in yes. very personal, very personal terms. And and sometimes it extends into the real world and threats and things like this. And and sometimes that can just kind of harden you. It can make you and I didn't realize how much it was hardening me until one of my very best friends pulled me aside and he said, I think you're not separating your online and offline worlds enough. Hmm. You're, you're kind of becoming a bully. And I was like, what? You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Are you, are you serious about that? And, and it really humbled me. Like it, it, it literally brought me to my knees to say, Lord, you know, please protect my heart from bitterness and anger in all of these, you know, back, all of these battles back and forth, but you got to have somebody in your life who can just say, kind of grab you by the lapels and say, come on, you know, come on, what's going on here? Yeah. And the, the opposite can also happen if you get, if you get good press or good feedback, you can begin to believe mm. the hype about yourself that, oh, oh sure. I, I must really be as wonderful and godly as this person <laughs> thinks I am. One of the disciplines I've put in place that has been helpful to me is, um, Emails I get from supporters, from readers, from whoever, uh, they all go through a certain email um, inbox, mm -hmm. which I don't have access to. They all go to my wife. And she sees all that stuff and then filters out ones that she thinks I should see. Sometimes critical, uh. like you need to hear this criticism and respond to this or sometimes positive, but she guards me from seeing it all and determines what's good for me. And one day we, <laughs> this was a... I don't know, a year ago or something, I got what was probably the most beautiful and touching positive email of my life, like from a stranger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I won't get into the details of it, but we, my wife and I were both in tears as we were reading this email and this person thanking me for the impact that uh, my books and things had had. And it was just a, an incredibly encouraging, affirming, beautiful moment. And not 15 minutes later... <laughs> We got another email from a total stranger and all it said was sky is an effing heretic and, and with, you know, but the full word obviously. And, yeah. and my wife turned to me and said, there it is. This is your whole life right here in one little <laughs> moment. <laughs> someone who thinks you walk on water and someone who just calls you an effing heretic. So, but it, it was nice to kind of have the balance. I, it was almost like the Lord knew. I don't want you to walk away thinking too highly of yourself. So here's this just to... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> bring you down a little bit, um, but it is really helpful to have someone else guarding the the gate on what gets yeah. to me and what doesn't. So I'm I'm very yeah. appreciative of that. We've spent a lot of time on this story. We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> can we can can we just shift gears really quick? And yeah. in ten minutes, Max, if you have the time, do you have the time? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I want to totally shift gears to talk about something in, in the political realm that I know you've written about, you've talked a lot about, and I think our listeners would be interested in hearing about, and that is um, election reform, but most specifically the Electoral Count Act of 1887 mm -hmm. and why <laughs> we should be thinking about something that sounds so archaic and ridiculous. Um, yeah. To set it up a little bit, there's been a lot of rhetoric in the media the last couple of weeks about uh, voter access reform, and sp specifically President Biden and the Democratic Party trying to push through these pretty dramatic changes in the way the country manages its elections in order to prevent um, racial discrimination becoming a factor again, arguing that state legislatures and especially the Republican Party are trying to limit access to the ballot. Uh, that's not appearing to go anywhere. There just isn't enough political will 
right. to make that happen. But it doesn't mean we can't do anything. So explain what the Electoral Count Act is, if you can. Yes, and, yes. yes. Because it's such a mess. And then why we need to care about this right now. Okay. This is something you're, Sky, you're singing my song right now. This is something I feel really passionately about because I feel like the ambiguities in the electoral count, electoral count act literally almost cost us our country in, in January of this, of 2021. And to tell you how much, how strongly I feel about it, I wrote a piece in the dispatch. We very much pride ourselves on very calm headlines, very calm argument. And I wrote a piece that was literally called Stop Screwing Around and Reform the Electoral Count Act with a subtitle that was, we're idiots if we don't. It's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> and here's why. So after the election of 1876, which was a just unbelievable near crisis uh, in American history, I don't need to go into all of it, but it was, it was right after the, it was soon after the Civil War, a real crisis um, with competing slates of electors and a lot of, uh, of, of challenging issues. Congress, about a decade longer afterwards in 1887, passed a law that tried to spell out exactly how Congress counts and certifies electoral votes. Okay. It should be a super, a super simple ministerial act where they just count and certify and only disqualify those electoral votes that have been submitted where there's obvious constitutional defect. Like imagine if a, if a state submitted electoral votes for an 18 year old, when the constitution specifies, you know, I have to be over a certain age. Um, but instead they passed a statute that the key, the key provision of it is one 809 word paragraph that I challenge you to read and fully understand. I tried now, to just read it, let alone understand it. It was non it was impossible. It's nuts. It's nuts. The overall meaning of it kind of leaks through, but the bottom line is what this one 809 word paragraph allows is for one senator and one congressman to call into question the electoral votes of any given state. Then the two chambers of Congress adjourn, and if they, if both chambers on a majority vote, um, essentially invalidate the electors from the state, those electors are invalidated, <laughs> and and so now this is something that you know in previous years before 2021, people had raised objections. Say, for example, to George Bush, it was largely a very silly symbolic act where they're just trying to signal opposition, but there was never any real concerted move to try to use the Electoral Count Act to overturn an election. All that changed in 2021. A, a law professor named John Eastman wrote a memo that both misread the Electoral Count Act and where he didn't like what the Electoral Count Act said, disregarded it to argue that, that uh, Mike Pence had the authority to um, invalidate electoral votes and declare Trump the winner or invalidate electoral votes and delay the certification of the election. And then other um, uh, senators and congressmen, for example, Paul Gosar and Ted Cruz combined to challenge the electoral votes of specific states. And this is what led to a lot of the chaos on January 6th. This is what led to Donald Trump arguing before January 6th, that Mike Pence should have played a key role. And so what we have to do is avoid that mess. And there's just a very few simple ways to do it. One very simple way to do it is to say, it is not just one member of Congress and one Senator who can challenge the electoral count in a state. It's not it. You have to, maybe you have to have a third of the members of Congress or a third of the Senate to challenge and certainly make it to where you cannot overturn an electoral count by anything other than supermajority vote, and also make it that the grounds for overturning a electoral count in a state have to be crystal clear and specified so that it's not some of this cracked nonsense like we saw in 2020 and 2021. And so, um, and this really gets to the, something that's super, super important, our real vulnerability 
We can have legitimate disputes and arguments over how easy or hard it is to vote in any given state. But our real vulnerability is not in vote casting, it's in vote counting. Right. And who's counting? And what the Electoral Count Act, a reform will do is make it very clear that Congress, absent very specific overriding constitutional concerns, cannot disrupt the count and certification of the election. Okay, a couple of things. Um, some of what's come out in the investigation about January 6th and what the Trump administration was trying to do showed that they had a very detailed plan based on an amb- based on the ambiguity of the Electoral Count Act to try to delay certification of Biden's win and keep Trump in office beyond January 20th. Strangely, there was some likelihood of success on their part had the insurrection not broken into the Capitol that day and disrupted the whole thing. So in a weird way, they their own people disrupted their well-thought-through plan that ended up screwing up their attempt to overthrow the election. Now, that, um, yeah, that's the wild, that's, <laughs> that's one of the wild counterfactuals, yeah. Okay. Secondly, though, um, is there enough will on the part, I, I think the Democratic Party's in line with reforming the Electoral Count Act to make it less ambiguous and, and raise some of the the standards that you just mentioned. Is there enough will on the Republican side? Do we have enough congressmen and senators on the Republican side of the aisle to actually do this? Okay, so here's where I've got bad news and good news. So the bad news is that Uh, Democrats had been tying Electoral Count Act reform to passage of their big election reform bill. Which seems to be their thing lately. They they tie really good legislation to impossible legislation, and then they (laughs) both go down. Yeah, exactly. So the big bill is gone for now. I mean, uh, Cinema and Mansion have said no. Uh, They're not going to override the filibuster. It's done. So now there is a bipartisan coalition. Axios reported on it, I believe, today. Um, they're trying to kind of reconstitute some of the bipartisan folks who got through the infrastructure bill in the Senate to see if they can do the same thing for the Electoral Count Act. And I strongly believe, and I have I've been in communication with people who are as in the know on this as you can be in the know on this, that there is bipartisan desire to reform the Electoral Count Act. And we're just basically waiting in many ways, uh, if McConnell and Schumer signal approval, then it should be a done deal. It should be a done deal. And it may well be a done deal. And there's actually bipartisan efforts to draft some improvements to the act. So I am of the opinion that while Congress often acts like, did you see Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Did I see it? It was (laughs) It was kind of a script for my teen years. Well, well you remember how the, you remember how the monks would chant and then hit themselves in the head. Yes, with uh, w- with tablets or books or whatever it was. That's often like Congress in action. <laughs> um, <laughs> while Congress often acts like that, there is a there is a I have an actual non uh, pipe dream level hope that we can get something done here. And the reason is that there are senators on both sides of the aisle who know that we came close to disaster on January 6th. And the last thing we need, Sky, the last thing we need is a mechanism where a, a small minority of cranks um, like the Ted Cruz's and the Paul Gosar's of the world can trigger the kind of debate and the kind of delay and certification that gives radicals the idea that they can intervene and gives radicals the idea that they can do something dramatic. And, and we don't need that. It, it, it's the kind of thing where um, you, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, it's an oncoming train, you know, it is, and you can like build a little off ramp quickly enough to escape it. And everyone's yelling, build the off ramp. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we might do it. This is a case where thankfully there is a clear legislative solution and hopefully there's enough people willing to take it to build that off ramp. Even if they do it 
And we do make it more difficult for a few cranks to screw up an election or decertify a vote or whatever, even if we accomplish that. I'm still worried that we're in big trouble. And here's why. Um, I mean, in 2021, the Trump campaign and and administration tried and was unsuccessful at stopping the inauguration of, of Joe Biden. But they did succeed in sowing a lot of doubt among a sizable number of Americans on the legitimacy of the election. And it feels to me like that's only getting worse because now you even have Democrats sowing doubt about the legitimacy of elections yeah. in some of their rhetoric, including President Biden's rhetoric. And if more and more Americans across the political divide no longer trust the outcomes of elections, even if all the evidence is there's no shenanigans, even if people can cast their votes, even if those votes are counted fairly, and even if Congress doesn't get in the way of validating those election results, you still don't have a very healthy democracy if most people won't accept the outcome of those elections. Oh, that is so true. Um, A a really sharp guy uh, named Coleman Hughes tweeted out something, in fact, today where he basically said, look, we're at a position where you could have every election be free and fair. Yeah. And we still tear ourselves to shreds because no one believes it's free and fair. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's quite literally where we're headed. Yeah, this is a good good step. I'm glad they're hopefully going to do it, but we have larger <laughs> larger issues to face, which we can yeah. talk about on a future French Friday. <laughs> David, thank you again for your time, uh, your insights about the Falwell story. We'll link to that um, Vanity Fair article in the show notes because everyone should read that and uh, consider some of the sources of these ideas when you do, because it shouldn't be taken as gospel truth, but it's still insightful. And we will catch up with you again next month. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sky. It is always, uh, I, I love French Fridays. They're a ton of fun and I'm always honored to be here. French Friday is a production of The Holy Post featuring David French and me, Sky Jitani. Production by Carla Haskins. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Music and theme song by Phil Vischer. This podcast is made possible by the support of Holy Post listeners like you. To find out how you can become a supporter of the Holy Post and to engage more common good Christian content, visit holypost.com.